most economists uh, usually ascribe growth to China's opening to the outside world, and that's certainly a big part of it. Uh, but most of the difference we find in growth rates cross-nationally aren't due to economic policy. They're actually due to uh, social and social, political, and environmental factors. There are three factors in particular that gave China a massive boost to its growth rate. Uh, one was declining fertility. Now, most people associate declining fertility with the one-child policy, but in fact, China's fertility rate uh, started declining in the 1960s. Declining fertility means that there are fewer children to care for, uh, and it also means that there are more adults uh, compared to the number of dependents in a society. Right. So this is a one-time benefit. Countries benefit enormously when they reduce their fertility rates. Every country in Asia went through the same transition uh, in, in Korea, in, in Singapore, all across uh, Southeast Asia right now. There are declining fertility rates that are leading to economic growth. The problem is this is a one-time trick. When you combine declining fertility with an aging population, it's a double whammy that instead of having children to care for, now people have elderly uh, to care for, elderly relatives to care for. The second uh, real uh, uh, boat boost to the Chinese economy, again starting in the 1970s but accelerating in the 1980s and 1990s, was urbanization. But urbanization again is a one, a one trick pony. Now China is nowhere near 100 percent urbanization, but China's urbanization now is starting to slow and inevitably over the next five or ten years it will slow even more. Uh, cities can't keep growing forever at the pace they have been growing. Uh, the third major boost to growth China has had has been using up its environment. If you sit back and think about it for a minute, you can only use your environment once. Right? So land can only be built on once, uh, rivers can only be polluted once, the air can only take so much air pollution from factories until you have to say no more. So all three of these limits, uh, the, the human factor, the urbanization factor, and the environmental factor, have all come to a head roughly at the same time, in the 2010s. Uh, and we really should expect China's growth to be more limited after this, simply because it can no longer take advantage of these uh, easy ways to grow. China in the year 1949 is a country that is emerging from an entire century of calamities uh, mostly imposed from outside. Uh, really what we've seen since 1949 is China's bounce back to its historical level of income vis-a-vis -vis the West. Uh, China had about half of Europe or America's GDP per capita in the uh, 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries, and it's growing towards that level now. The real question we have is, will it go from half of that level up to that level? That is, will it converge fully with Western countries? And I don't really think it will. Uh, I think if we look at China's social structure today, China's social structure today resembles, in almost every important way studied by academics, resembles that of Mexico or Brazil or South Africa. It resembles the middle-income countries of the world. If China's social structure resembles that of middle-income countries, I would expect its economy to follow. Uh, that is, China is not converging with America and Europe. China is converging with Mexico, Brazil, Russia, and South Africa. The only way to move from that level to a rich country status is by a systemic change in social structure and in, in the way society is uh, structured, operated, and governed. Governments should pursue policies that provide public goods to the entire population of the country. Uh, and public goods include all sorts of things. Uh, I think China has been excellent at providing physical public goods, uh, metro systems in the cities, uh, housing, uh, water supply. Uh, you know, China in many ways has been exemplary in its provision of, of public goods that are represented by physical infrastructure. On the other hand, many public goods are less tangible. Uh, the rule of law, uh, you know, good government, uh, responsive government, uh, good education systems, universal health care, uh, general promotion of public health. Uh, on these kinds of public goods, China has been less successful. Uh, and that's incredibly difficult to accomplish. Uh, I mean, the reason social structures are so stable is that social structures benefit people who already have power and already have money in the society. China's political elite, China's business elite, 
are doing just fine. Uh, China is leading the world in the manufacturing of millionaires and billionaires, right? So there's not a problem in China from the perspective of the wealthy and powerful. Uh, the problem in China is only a problem from the perspective of the poor and the less powerful, from the workers in the large factories, from the, for the peasants. Uh, so it's very difficult for a country to create or to innovate uh, more beneficial social policies when the people doing the innovating benefit from the policies that are already in place. Let me contrast three ways about, uh, of looking at the future of economic development uh, for countries like China. The first is a typical business school approach. The usual business school approach is a focus on entrepreneurship, technology, the very cutting edge. Those things are very important for students at business schools. That is, those kind of things are very important for people with higher education, with capital to invest, uh, with high levels of, of knowledge. Uh, those are the important things for their personal development. Uh, second, there's an economics profession approach. Uh, the economics profession has uh, collectively done an enormous amount of research into growth rates. And new growth theory, as it's called, really focuses on the human and institutional elements that are necessary for growth. Unfortunately, economists tend to focus on just one institutional element, which is the existence of free markets. I think economists are absolutely right that free markets backed up by the rule of law and contracts and property rights, that all of that is important, but that's only a small part of what makes rich countries rich. What's really important, and, and the third perspective, is to add all of the social baggage that goes with that. That is, free markets and rule of law are wonderful, but countries also need public investment in education, a public investment in infrastructure. Uh, they also need universal health care systems, and, you know, public health systems that embrace the whole population. I think that China should move in the direction toward America and Europe, not move in the direction that America or Europe is moving. So the Republicans in America want to reduce the role of the state in, uh, in the private sector and, and in the country. But the role of the state in America is much larger than the role of the state in Chinese society. Now that may sound really strange to hear from an American, uh, but the fact is that the United States government uh, is more deeply involved in regulating business and setting standards for business and providing unemployment insurance and providing social security insurance and providing health care for all Americans over age 65, for subsidizing the hospital system for other Americans. We provide universal primary and secondary education for free. We provide highly subsidized university education. I mean, the American government is extraordinarily deeply involved in American society. The Democratic Party in America wants to make it more involved. The Republican Party wants to make it less involved, but either way you look at it, it's much more deeply ingrained in American society than the Chinese government is in Chinese society. Uh, I think what China needs is for the Chinese government to become even more deeply involved in promoting the well-being of Chinese citizens.